Hello and welcome to episode seven of the Physique Development Podcast. Today's episode is our newly structured rapid Q&A. So this is where we take your questions and quickly answer them with the need to knows on the topic based on our education and experience working with clients. We will answer questions on topics such as body recomps, guidance on off-season length and recommended cardio, scale weight, adjusting macros, working out when sore, and much more. As always, it is our goal to not only supply you, the listener, with valuable insights on the topics or questions, but also to just plant some seeds for further research and thought. So without further ado, we will get into this rapid Q&A. Awesome. Thanks for that intro there, Austin. I'll start off with the first question. So the first question was asked, where do you like to see cardio in the off season if sedentary and don't want to count steps? So the first thing for this question is kind of asking why you don't want to count steps. Maybe it's something as far as um, it's hard for you to wear your watch and see the steps like close up or see like the rings close up if you have an Apple watch or whatever the other watches do. I'm not super well versed on every single fitness tracker out there. Um, but I would ask yourself why you don't want to count steps, because I think steps is a very easy goal to have where you don't have to push together all of your movement. Because I think that when it comes to recommended daily movement or weekly movement, a lot of times guidelines say 150 minutes of movement a week. But that's very hard to count like, okay, I'm walking further to the grocery store, or I went outside and walked around my it's like hard to add up for the whole week. So steps are an easy way to go about that. If you're not wanting to count steps, I would say um, going for walks or doing some sort of movement for 10 to 20 minutes a day in off season. It's something that um, that's kind of what I try to stick to, whether that's a 10 or 15 minute warm up before I train or cool down, just walking at a slower pace. But heart health is so important. And that's why you want to do cardio. It's not necessarily like all cardio is for losing weight. It's more so you want to make sure that your health is in tip top shape. So I would say 10 to 20 minutes per day. Um, and just being able to move your body, whether that's walking or doing yoga, um, or whatever it may be. Awesome. So I, I have one thing to kind of just touch on there. And, and I think the more you can move again, the more you can sort of, we kind of talk about this energy flux equation, this calories in calories out. And it seems that the more you can move, the, the better your overall metabolic health and physical health is going to be. So again, even in your off season, the goal obviously is going to be building muscle. If you're like a competitor or in general, just trying to improve your body composition as a whole. And the goal isn't necessarily to say, and you'll hear me talk about this quite a bit, but the goal isn't necessarily to say like, let's move the least amount we can and just eat at that maintenance, right? So the more we move, the more that maintenance will be adjust it. It'll be a moving target as maintenance is always a moving target based off all the parameters that go into what a, ma a maintenance is right for your calories, for your, your physical activity and all of that stuff. So, um, you know, I, I think one thing I've learned from, uh, Dr. Ben house and one of his nutrition courses is looking at, uh, they looked at like, uh, professional athletes, like NFL athletes. So you get, you got these massive offense and defensive linemen, right? And they're gargantuan humans, you know, they pack a lot of adipose tissue, but metabolically they're extremely healthy still. Right. And it's because they get so much activity yet. They have more adipose tissue. They get a lot of physical activity, right? So this isn't to say, you know, that is the only scenario there, but that is to say more physical activity is probably better. We are built to move. And again, I think going back and asking the question, like, why don't you want to um, is it just because you don't want to, like you're, you're fighting against tracking anything or it, just keeping an eye on it is probably a good idea. And a 10 minute walk is around a thousand steps. So if you can do a 20 minute walk, 30 minute walk, you spread that out throughout the day, two to 3000 steps, not that tough. And it's going to keep you in better health. So next question, is it ever necessary to wear a belt for supporting to support support during lifts? Right. So is it important or necessary to wait, wear a weight belt for supporting for support during lifts? I apparently can't read. So weight belts, are they important? Are they needed? Are they necessary? Um, if you're not sure what a weight belt is, it's basically that, um, that belt that sort of goes around your core, uh, is sometimes they're Velcro. Sometimes they're, uh, these impossible wrenching belts that you have to sort of use the squat rack to get into. I remember Alex had this belt, this red belt. I'm not sure if he still has it, but 
it was seemingly like rib bruising to get in and out of. And I had this like clasp belt, this blue one. What are those called? Enzer belts? Yeah. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> yeah. These Enzer belts that are impossible, right? And it was always a tell like during prep, if you, the if you moved a notch, you're like, ah, oh, moving in the right direction. You know, <laughs> I had to, had to move a notch on my weight belt. But anyways, they add support. Um, and I, I'd say like my rule of thumb is typically like two times your body weight. If you're doing anything two times your body weight, probably a good idea to, to probably use one if, if you find it necessary. Um, but as a whole, I, I think it's, if it's something that gives you comfort and gives you confidence or you had lower back issues in the past or something, uh, some changes in structural integrity uh, of your core or anything like that, it's probably best to protect yourself and progressively work up your core strength separately and try to build that up over time. Um, you know, it, I often see it's like sort of like a badge of honor, like deadlifted X amount of weight without a belt. And it's like, Oh, sweet dude. Um, I guess you're better than me or better than everyone else who wore a belt when they lifted that much weight. So, um, for me, it always go, it always goes back to health. It always goes back to just structural integrity and sort of the motto that I, I lived by for a long time. And that's live to train another day. So I'd much rather use a belt and be quote unquote less cool, uh, and be able to train tomorrow than not, <laughs> if that makes sense. Yeah. The only thing I have to add just to explain with a belt, why you would wear it is it is used to decrease the load on your lower back during those heavy exercises. So by pushing your abdomen against the belt during those heavy lifts, you can increase the stability of your lower back. So then you can also increase intra-abdominal pressure as you're going through the movement. Um, they're definitely not necessary like Austin said, but it is going to be something to kind of depending on where that looks like for you, um, for those movements and where you feel the safest. Um, so we do have a video on our YouTube channel if you do want to check through about straps and belts and why you would wear them and when to wear them. Awesome. All right. Question three, how does PD taper steps cardio along with calories in a reverse diet? Uh, now, when we look at reverse diets, this is going to be different for every individual. Uh, so this is a great time to work with a coach. And it also depends on how quickly you are willing to add body fat. Uh, if you are okay with adding a little bit more body fat than uh, the next person, and you just want to get back to your caloric maintenance, then this is going to be a little bit more rapid. If you are wanting to stay leaner and to um, keep things a little bit more uh, gradual with the, the intake, obviously, it's going to be less at that point. So to give you a, a definitive number, I think would be naive on our end to say X amount of calories per week. Um, you could go on the the lower end, uh, potentially uh, around you know fifty to sixty calories per week, which would be very slow progression within the uh, calorie adjustments. You could even go on the upper end of hundred to one hundred and twenty calories uh, per week. So it can range anywhere from there. And um, and I'm, I, what I'm saying is more nutrition based, and that's to daily intake. So you're looking at an average uh, over that time frame um, from a, a cardio and step perspective. I like to keep cardio in. I think it's beneficial. Uh, moving is going to always be helpful, as you can kind of tell, is a general gist from us uh, overall. Um, but slowly but surely, uh, bringing it down to a more moderate pace and and finding a, a place that they're, the athlete is able to um, be at maintenance calories and then uh, still being progressive within adding muscle tissue and things of that nature. Yeah. And I would also say the enjoyment of the person and then how high their cardio got during prep. So for example, for myself, my cardio is normally pretty high during prep, just what my body has to do, nothing wrong on my end or my coach's end, just what needs to be done. Um, and so it's something that I can't maintain or sustain that. And I don't want to, because I do want to build muscle. Um, so if someone has very high cardio, getting it down from there might take longer. So don't compare yourself and be like, well, Susan was able to cut out all cardio and now she's just doing a few walks a day when your body is in a very fragile spot as you're reversing. And so being able to take your situation and not look at others and be able to move from there. Um, and then for myself as well, I'm extremely sedentary. So I do keep in cardio just because otherwise I will get 1000 steps a day and not that 10,000 steps is the end all be all, but it is something where like we've said, moving is good. <laughs> yeah. And just, uh, I think for me, it really comes down to looking at the bigger picture of your, your overall movement. Right. And we've kind of, this is an echo upon all the talk on physical activity we've given, but 
again, the goal is not to just not move. Um, and some people's, again, it's going to come to your BMR, your, your metabolic rate, all this stuff is going to come down to age, genetics, all of these different things, gender, um, how much muscle mass you carry, um, what that cardio looked like at the end of prep or um, something like that, or the end of your, your fat loss phase or something like that. Um, but if it's not something that's just an abundant stress on your system, I don't see it as a negative to get to move more. Like if you're just used to moving more and it helps you sleep better, it helps you digest better. It helps you stay in shape. It helps you have more energy, like all of the things, then it definitely isn't as long as it's not the stress that is keeping you from building muscle. Um, then I don't see it definitely as an, as a negative thing. Awesome. Next question here is, is body recomp at maintenance macros or calories possible when BMI is already normal? So my answer to this is 100%, but it is going to be slow. And so when you're trying to recomp your body, you've heard of the terms cutting and bulking or dieting and bulking or being in a surplus. Those are ways to get to your goal, quote unquote, faster if you go about them in an intelligent way, that is. Um, but staying at maintenance is completely okay. You don't need to pull in one way or the other. And you will see body recomp changes, but it will take time to be able to see those. And I know often it's just like a race against time. It feels like with a lot of people of just being like, how can I optimize this? Or how can I change this? And time is normally the biggest component for you being able to reach your goals. Uh, my work ethic and my my work that I've been doing on my body, some of it has changed over the years, but more than anything, my physique has changed because I've allowed it time. So you definitely can change how your body looks, but be able to be in it for the long game and not think six weeks at maintenance is going to bring you the same thing as six weeks in a deficit or six weeks in a surplus um, and being able to really reframe what your goals are and reframe where your mindset is to be able to see that change in your physique. So with that one as well, um, again, it kind of comes back to the if we're looking at it as like a dial system, you kind of turn up or turn down the dial in terms of intensity. So maintenance, just think of it's sort of dial, the dials in the middle of the road. Um, if you're thinking of in terms of like a thermostat, it, it's sort of at room temperature. Uh, it's not going to be too hot or too cold. It's kind of just is what it is. Um, and again, as Sue said, it just comes down to a lot of consistency and how far off is that goal and what's going on in the rest of your life. Can you actually give, you know, a hundred percent to being as intense, right? Turning up that dial to 10 and just being sort of reckless in a positive sense towards your goals. Um, you know, at a time in, I know my life, I, there was times where I could be quote unquote reckless with those goals in, in a positive sense. So I could train, I could train twice a day. Um, you know, I could lift hundreds of thousands of pounds of volume in a week's time and, that was seemingly very productive towards a goal. And now that's not necessarily even possible for me. Um, and I, I don't want to necessarily dedicate that much time to it. So um, just understand that if you hang around maintenance, maintenance, maintenance isn't regression by default. Um, so don't think it is. Uh, it's just kind of going to depend on what's going on in the rest of your life. And consistency over time is definitely the recipe for success. How long to reverse slash maintain before cutting again? So again, I think this is going to heavily depend. Um, so in terms of like competition prep, I'll have Alex and Sue speak more to this. Um, but in terms of just the kind of it, it's, a, it's similar after a fat loss phase or something, but contest prep, you typically get a bit more lean. You typically do a little bit more down regulation of some hormones um, and, and stuff like that. So in terms of uh, speaking generally about just kind of gen pop people um, and lifestyle type clients, I, I think it's going to depend on what that looks like for you. Like where is that set point? Where is that maintenance for you? Um, and how long is it going to take us to get there? And, and, and psychologically, are you in a position where you'd rather sort of go a bit quicker, get there, be a bit more comfortable, or do you want to take a bit longer, um, stay a bit leaner longer and not take the, the blunt of 
you know, upping calories. The end goals are generally um, going to be pretty similar, uh, but it's just the timeline in which we get there um, can be a bit different. Um, but I would say controlling controlling that is a good idea and keeping tabs on it is a good idea. Not going overboard is a good idea. And, and that's where a coach can come in for the accountability and when to make those adjustments based off of everything you've probably discussed leading into that point and, and reversing out. Yeah, I'll, I'll give two examples uh, with lifestyle clients who maybe need to lose like 50 pounds. Let's say we need something in great detail. Something that we utilize at, at physique development is kind of like a, uh, a dieting phase for X amount of time and then spending three to four weeks at maintenance and then getting right back into dieting and kind of going in that feng shui for a year's time or what have you to lose that 50 pounds or, or whatever it is um, to make that happen. So if the individual asking this question is more of that suit, then I would recommend something of that nature working alongside a coach. If you're looking, if someone ask this from a contest prep perspective, uh, I would encourage you to add surplus into your options here where you're going to need to reverse, you're going to need to get to maintenance, and then you're going to need to be in a slight surplus for a period of time before you get back into prep. Um, it would be very, it'd be tough on your system to go dieting phase, short reverse, short maintenance phase, right back into dieting. Um, so I would encourage you to spend a little bit more time either at maintenance or into that surplus to allow for hormonal function, different things of that nature, and for you to add the tissue that you actually need probably um, to see better progress on stage the next time you're there. Yeah. And with this, it's something that you have to take into account how long you were dieting before you're like, if you're asking this question, you've been dieting for six months, I would recommend taking a good amount of time. So uh, a common thing you might hear is the length of the diet or double spend that away from dieting before you go back into a diet. Now that's not a hard and fast rule, but it's a good guideline to go by. Now, if you're someone who your dieting history, you've barely ever dieted, and you're in a really good spot hormonally, then go ahead and you can have a diet, have a shorter time at maintenance and go and diet again because your body is going to be more responsive. But what you don't want to do is get into the habit of dieting for three months, taking one month off, dieting for six months, taking one month off, and then getting into this cycle where you're just down regulating everything. So um, number one tip here is the best way to be efficient and have the best results in a diet is to spend time away from dieting. So being able to zoom out, look at the big picture and decide what your goal is and how you want to get there and what your quality of life along the way is also going to be. Perfect. And that filters us into the next question of how to make the most out of a long improvement season. Uh, this is something that I'm painfully passionate about and something that I'm dealing with on a day-to-day -day basis with many of our competitors in their improvement seasons and it being tough. Uh, the number one thing is uh, keep your ass off of social media. It's very <laughs> easy to uh, see other girls uh, or, or men uh, competing, very lean, uh, having awesome pumps and you're like, I'm kind of looking a little soft here. I, I, I want to be, I want to be leaner. And it's, it, this comparison game is, is very vicious. And so keeping, keeping yourself all out of that uh, scenario is going to be important. And, and the next thing for a long improvement season is that you take each training phase, you take each session and that's what you're focusing on. It, it's more of a day to day focus, even more so than when it was in prep, because in prep, you've got a, you got a light at the end of the tunnel. You have something that you're looking forward to working towards, if you will. And if you have, a lot of improvements that you're trying to make. Maybe it's a two, even three year improvement season. That light at the end of the tunnel is it's pitch black. Like you're, you're not seeing much of anything. Um, and so it's, it's a matter of, of making the most out of every single day and prioritizing the, the daily task and just ticking the boxes. Uh, and that's how you're going to maximize the improvement season because um, for clients or individuals who go from season to season and they get the same feedback from the judges each year, um, that sucks way worse than uh, doing the monotonous stuff every single day uh, by, you know, getting to that next show and being like, damn, I didn't make the improvements that I needed to. Um, it's, it's a lot better to do the monotonous task than find yourself in that situation.
Yeah. And Alex has a post he recently did on this about keeping the fire in your improvement season um, and being able to keep that moving forward. Because in prep, honestly, it's so much easier because you're getting leaner and that's exciting. And you can see those changes. We've talked about it before. As far as like 12 weeks dieting, you can see a hell of a lot of changes. 12 weeks building muscle, you might be like, oh my gosh, I look the exact same. And that's just the truth of the matter. And it can be very discouraging. So not taking every week and comparing your picture the week previous, which you could do while you're dieting because you can see changes day to day, week to week. But with building muscle, not always comparing your pictures, looking back at your pictures, hyper analyzing them, putting in the work daily, getting it done. And another very helpful thing is being able to have goals along the way, going into an off season without attainable and laid out goals, which we talked about smart goals and goal setting in another podcast episode, um, without those in place, it's hard. You're just going and then you have no light, like Alex said, and it's very hard to keep doing it. It's very easy to make excuses and be like, oh, this doesn't really matter if I finish off this last exercise. I just want to go home or what's it going to be an extra handful of this or if I don't track this day, but that adds up. And I can tell you after walking off the stage multiple times with not the placing that I want, like it has been light bulb moment after light bulb moment of this is where the change happens. And it's hard to remember that, but setting some goals for yourself, having some goals inside of the gym and having some goals completely outside of fitness is the best way you can make the most of an improvement season to get to the point where you're so excited to diet again. And you've optimized so much and lived so much of your life that you're not like, oh, I need to diet because I feel like a piece of shit, but I'm excited to diet because I've spent so much time improving myself. So you want to be able to look at your goals inside of fitness, but also make a lot of life goals outside of fitness um, and be able to have those um, smart goals in place um, to be able to measure them along the way. All right, on to the next question here. How do you stay present and positive in the moment? Uh, so this is one um, from the question box. All these are from a question box on our different social medias. Um, and for me, I personally don't always stay positive in the moment. Um, I try to, but it's not the reality. And on social media, um, you might see people present themselves as more positive. Um, and more than anything for me, that's to remind myself to be positive, just not to be a negative Nelly. Um, but I've grown a lot in this. I used to be one of the most negative people in the room to the point that like no one wanted to hang out with me because I was just that person who always complained and was always negative. Um, and I realized I had to become the person I liked to spend time with. Um, and so with that, I had to really think about how my actions come across and how they serve me. So 90% of the time being negative, doesn't help a situation. And I could probably even increase that to 99% of the time being negative doesn't help a situation. Um, and so being able to vent when you need to, but also also being able to move on. I was talking to a client the other day about a huge change since Alex and I have gotten married as he doesn't let me dwell. Um, I used to be the queen of dwelling in my feelings and in my negativity. And if I either pick apart my body, dwell in a situation or like complain about something repetitively, he nips that directly in the butt and does not let me continue with it, which is great. At first it was quite a, an assimilation or not assimilation. I don't know what word I'm thinking acclamation. of acclamation <laughs> um, because I was like, oh, my gosh, just why, why do you hate this me? This dude's kind of a dick. <laughs> yeah, basically what I thought. But it really came to shifting how I responded in situations, realizing that there will always be sucky situations in life, but you don't have to stay in the suck just to say it sucks. Um, so it's something that I often used being negative and I wore it as like a badge of honor as like my life sucks. Everything's so hard for me. And it was something that I had to realize like, again, complaining or dwelling on things that suck or not being positive doesn't help the situation. And not that it's supposed to be like oh, good vibes all the time. It's not. It's, it's just not plain and simple. Um, it's something that there are bad days, but it's being able to look at the grander picture, as I've said multiple times in this podcast, and I need to think of a different phrase to say at this point. <laughs> Yeah, taking a step back is is probably the, one of the most helpful things in, in finding a new vantage point on a given topic or situation or something you're, you're dwelling on or ruminating on. Um, and I can relate to this more than a lot of people, I'm sure, and, and as much maybe as much as a lot of people can. And I think we all have our, our different demons, if you will. There's probably a better word for that. But there's 
there's always things that sort of ruminate within our mind or, or situations that always kind of take themselves and, and twist them, twist themselves into, into something that becomes something and it repeatedly comes something. And, you know, this kind of along is along the lines of um, like anxieties or, or complaining and anxieties and, and complaining can be something that sort of pinpoints a problem and it becomes something of how do we now address that problem and execute on coming up with a solution and then actually come going through and moving through and executing the solution that we came up with um, and having people to talk to um, friends partners um, parent like whoever you trust and whoever you want to talk to uh, and, and have people around you that can support that can understand that can hear it out and know that it comes from a place of like I, I do want to improve i do want to get better and i don't want to just sit in this sit in this space right so you know alex telling sue like hey we can't we can't just sit here and ruminate on this and I, i'm putting words in his mouth i don't know how that conversation went but <laughs> um you know that, that's the same topic like you know my wife is the first person to, to kind of snap me out of something uh, and vice versa and so you want to surround yourself with people that know you enough to be able to to know sort of when to when to empathize and show you the compassion you need but you also need that same level of hey let's get over this um let's move on and you need to come up with a solution and, and actually see it through um, so I, I think taking a step back and realizing that not everything's always going to be hunky dory positive vibes only. Um, that's just not the real world. That, that's not the human emotion. That's not the human experience, but you have the option to approach any situation with a different lens or a different filter. So I think that's powerful in trying to, whether it's a negative situation, a lot, uh, we all come through or come to negative situations on a daily basis. And if you're someone who challenges yourself and puts yourself into to stick like hard and challenging situations or, you know, you go out on a limb, you, you take a risk, like you're going to be met with a lot of setbacks um, or a lot of quote unquote negative things that, that may occur. Um, or you may just be in a, an area of life where this is the, this is the card being dealt. These are the cards being dealt to you. So in that though, what I want to finish up with is just seeing the positive in the situation. Um, you know, there's going to be negatives, almost always going to be a negative, but there's almost always a positive you can take from something, a learning lesson. Um, and it, it may be really hard to face and you may have to sort of really look at yourself in the mirror and, and understand that, all right, this is on me. Um, and what about this situation can I take on a positive note? What, what can I learn from it? What can I move on and become better for it? Um, and I think that is how you sort of stay positive in the moment and staying present in the moment kind of comes with being able to take a step back and not get caught up in your emotion in the short term, but more, more or less think of the long term of that given situation. Changing topics. Can a heavy leg day make the scale go up in the morning? Absolutely. So any sort of excessive stress on the system can make the scale move. Um, edema caused by uh, inflammation, muscle damage, um, all of these different things from a, a heavy or very intense training session can make the scale move um, depending on the, the severity or the intensity of that session and how over your recoverability requirements or allotment you have. So your ability to recover from that stimulus or session the more you may have to deal with this, right? It, it could be so much that it disrupts digestion. It causes inflammation, causes excessive muscle soreness and, and edema within those muscles. So we've all had that like, sh like you don't even like look at my legs. Like they, they hurt that bad. Like don't even look at them. It's like you're touching them with your eyes. Um, and, and so I, I, I know for a fact, I've definitely gone through a lot, a lot, a lot of sessions like that. Um, and those definitely shouldn't be your marker of success in any given situation. But there's always those sessions where you're like, man, I just got after it. I don't care what happens. Or you're in a situation, you're with people who want that session 
to be like that. And sometimes you just have to woman or man up and just say, Hey, all right, I can hang with you. I'm going to, you're going to kill yourself. It's a Will Smith. I'm going to die on the treadmill sort of motivational speech within your mind. And I get that. And I think there's sort of these moments where have that, have that session, prove it to yourself, prove it to them, prove it to whoever you want to prove it to. Um, but that absolutely should not be your norm, but that excessive stress, except excessive stimulus, edema, muscle damage, um, inflammation, all of that stuff can move this, move the scale and probably an upward direction, um, and, and disrupt digestion and a lot of other things. So use it sparingly. Yeah. Um, and, and keep in mind too, if you're doing like a full leg session, you're training three, right? I mean, if you're training calves, I guess four very, very large muscle groups. Um, uh, so keep that in mind where you're, you're causing a lot of damage to that tissue. Um, Yeah. And I don't let that deter you from training um, legs just because you're afraid of the scale going up. But knowing the factors that make the scale go up is important um, to be able to listen to your body, to read that data and be able to progress forward. Awesome. All right. How patient should I be with scale weight before adjusting macros? Um, This is a very much so it depends situation. It depends on your adherence. How well did you track? Um, Truthfully, did you go by the uh, the kitchen and and grab a couple of M and M's? Especially with the holiday season in place here, I'm sure that uh, families have um, different treats scattered all throughout the house. How much snacking did you do? Um, Were you able to complete all your training sessions? Were you able to uh, complete all of your cardio sessions. How was your sleep? How was your digestion? Really analyzing your biofeedback is going to be very important. When clients depart from physique development, we encourage them to keep up with their check-ins to keep them in alignment with their their, um, biofeedback and all that uh, jazz. So um, once you have those things in alignment and you truly had you know great adherence i would i would imagine that making a, adjustments every 14 to 21 days would be very beneficial for you if you don't see the scale trend that you are uh, expecting to see whether that be up or down uh, being in a surplus or a deficit um, but i would encourage you to really analyze things from a, a full picture perspective before you were to to jump the gun and, and make adjustments Yeah. And with that, being able to not only look at all the factors Alex talked about, but making sure that you're looking at measurements, pictures, how clothes fit, um, being able to see those different factors to make sure that you're, you're taking everything into consideration, especially if you're going at it alone. It's very hard not to be impatient. I mean, it's hard to be patient even with a coach, but it's even harder when you don't have a coach because then you're second guessing yourself. Um, Also realizing the scale's not always going to increase or decrease every day. We're looking for trends, not it to be linear. Um, And then we also want to look at averages. Um, So if let's say the scale has changed recently and then it doesn't change for five days, it could still be on the average of what you want as a whole. Um, So don't just change things for the sake of changing. Be able to look at those variables. Be a Objective, be patient, recognize the variables, and be painfully honest with yourself along the way. Yeah. Objective data points and doing your homework is probably the best way to, I could put it, and or the way I see it in my mind is, are you, do you have data points you're tracking? Are they objective? Are they in alignment with the goal you're trying to get to? And are you doing your homework? Are you, I mean, you can't, if you want to get good grades, you got to do your homework, man. So just do your homework, show up, track the right things, um, and, and try to adjust accordingly. Perfect. So high hunger during a reverse, stick to the plan or honor your hunger. This is a great question, I think, because um, it's something that I'm going to talk about this specifically when it comes to a reverse diet. If you are already at the goal of weight loss, I am not applying this to everything in life. So please do not take this out of context. If you're not tracking, if you are going for more of a balanced approach, please do not take these words the wrong way. Um, So one thing is to ask yourself, is it a handful of days or just one day? Or has it been something where you're like, uh, it's insatiable hunger constantly? Because that's one thing to look at. If it's just a few days or one day, stick to the plan. It's something that you will be hungry just like you were when you were dieting. Because you're technically still in a deficit from where your maintenance calories are. Um, but it's also something regardless of if you're in a deficit or not. Um, it's something that when you're dieting, did you ask yourself, am I hungry? Or should I stick to the plan? Or should I honor my hunger? 
Probably not because you knew that you had to follow the plan to be able to see the results and you knew that you were going to be hungry. Knowing going into a reverse, there are going to be days of high hunger is so helpful. So don't think I have more food. I should be satiated because that's not the case. I was eating very low food during prep and now my food is much, much higher than that. And there are still days where I'm hungry. And in prep, if I would have had a day where I ate as much food as I eat now, I would have been stuffed. I would have felt great, but it's all relative. So look at that first, but also recognize that your body is coming back into equilibrium. And so that's going to take some time as well. So um, you're still going to be hungry in reverse. Knowing that is just helpful in and of itself um, and knowing that you're going to be hungry during a deficit and it's not bad to feel hunger in those scenarios. And uh, if it becomes unbearable or extremely frequent um, or you start to have feelings of wanting to binge or overeat or go balls to the wall, please talk to either a professional or your coach. Having open communication is extremely important. Um, and it's something that people will also think like, I'm so hungry because my metabolism is so revved up, so I should eat more. And that's not always the case. So I'm going to pass it over to Alex just because I know he hears this a lot in check-ins with working with a lot of competitors. Yeah. Um, I, I think that the, um, something that we drive home a lot is that if you can really uh, keep incredible adherence the first four weeks of that reverse diet coming out of a contest prep, uh, that, I mean, that makes you truly tough as nails. Uh, that is a testament to your mental um, strength because at that point, coming out of a show, you, are, you have all of your loved ones who have been craving for uh, you to be a little bit more lax with your diet, uh, definitely nudging you towards eat normal, eat normal, eat normal. And it's like, as much as you would like to, you need to still stick to the plan and, and really push forward because you're in a very vulnerable place coming out of that contest prep from a hormonal perspective, as well as adding body fat is, is very, very easy at that point. So, um, yeah, I, I think that uh, it is a test of mental fortitude and, and it is a time to really buckle down uh, following the, the contest prep. I think it's a great transition. I won't add anything to that, but I think this is a really good transition, transition into the next question, which comes around mental whirlwinds after shows. So does it get easier the more you go through it or is it crap every time? Well, where in the crap are you? <laughs> so how does it suck? Why does it suck? Um, this is where being really objective can, can help. You know, do you have a coach you can speak to? Do you have someone around you who has experience with the crap, with the suck? Um, and I will speak to my experience here in saying after my first show and my second show, there was a night and day difference in between my, that first and second show into my last show. There is an unrecognizable difference. I, I really couldn't be bothered after my last show to, to think about things that sucked. I was just in a place where, hey, all right, I know the plan. I know what I need to do. I know how this works. I've been here before. Uh, and I know exactly what needs to happen this evening. And I know what needs to happen tomorrow. And I, I know what needs to happen for the next four weeks from now, as Alex was speaking on. So I think it's realizing where does it suck? Where's your mind at? And, and where, where within the crap are you living? Um, be really, really objective with yourself. Be honest with yourself. Um, one of the, probably the best ways to do this that I found is to journal, to write it down, get it out of your head. Um, be able to objectively look at it on paper and ask yourself, am I completely full of shit here? Am I complaining just for the sake of complaining? Is this really a woe is me situation? Is this really, really challenging? Like, does this really tap my reserves? Like at a scale of one to 10, is this really a 10? Like, is this all that I'm capable of handling? Probably not. So be objective with yourself. Um, talk to someone you, you know and trust who has experience with it and answer the question, where within the crap do you live? So. <laughs> Um, I, I'll put the context of if this was your first show ever, I think that within our experience, we see this differently with males and females. So for example, if the female has never really gone through a surplus or, um, maintenance phase in their life and, and, uh, they may have chronically dieted, you know, leading into that first show, they've only dieted and, um, 
basically the only time they ever tracked food was maybe two diet leading into that show. And then now they've achieved uh, this exceptional amount of leanness. And now you're, uh, and that's what you've been striving for the entire time to come out of that is, is very, very challenging. So giving yourself as much grace as possible, it definitely will get easier with time. Now, what we see with males is that the first time they get on stage, 999% of the time, um, they're too small. And so they want to grow immediately. So it's like, let's get as many calories as possible. Um, and so it's a little bit different from a male to female perspective in, in our experience. Okay. And uh, Siri thought that I was asking her a question. That entire thing just was recorded. Um, <laughs> and so, yeah, it's a little bit different from, from both, but it gets, it certainly gets easier from show to show uh, and you get better at it and your understanding obviously improves and uh, you find your triggers within that too of things that uh, were issues with you previously and all those different things are, are helpful. Maybe we should do a whole segment on asking Siri questions and then correcting what Siri says. That may be good. That may be good. <laughs> uh, but I agree with both of them here. I'm just going to talk on a few other things. So one thing that Alex touched on for females, how it's difficult, is that we live in a society that smallness is praised. Um, and it's something that women are often not only expected to be small, but it's something that I was even reading the other day talking about how women always want a male who's taller than them or they try to be smaller to fit to that narrative because men are supposed to be big and strong and women are supposed to be small and dainty kind of concept. So I know that's going a little bit deeper than probably this person wanted, but I think it's an interesting parallel to draw as far as what that looks like in society. So being able to reflect on that, um, how society might be um, changing your mental headspace. Another thing is it can be crap every time if you don't fix your crap. So um, it can be crap if you don't reflect and grow from the crap. So like Austin said, he learned from the first two shows and then he moved forward and was able to have an unrecognizable difference going in or leaving the third show. It can also be like crap every time if you don't have a good headspace through prep and or you consistently prep. So if you are consistently going cut, bulk, cut, bulk, cut, bulk, having very long preps, very short time away from dieting. That's when I see people go balls to the wall because they're like, I only have three months to eat this food. They gain a lot of weight. They feel very uncomfortable. And then they kind of have the thought process, well, I'm going to lose it all during prep. And that can turn into an extremely crappy, crappy spot to be in, not only hormonally, mentally, headspace, everything, ability to lose weight and build muscle in the future. You hit the nail on the head for all of those. It can also be like crap if you don't have a coach that you trust and will keep your health in mind. If you don't trust your coach, not only are you going to be second guessing it, um, but if you don't have someone that you think is going to care about your health in the long term and not about just putting trophies or putting wins under their belt, that's going to be important. Um, and then it's going to be like crap if you don't set new goals past being stage lean. Um, so if you just kind of fall into like we talked about previously of not having goals in place. And then it can also be like crap if you only see yourself as worthy when you are stage lean. Um, and like I said, repeatedly prep the second you get uncomfortable. Um, so kind of like Austin said, being able to journal, understand why you feel like crap, where you are in the crap, and being able to move yourself out of that. Just like the complaining, how Austin said that normally is pinpointing something that needs to be addressed or some problem that needs to be solved. It's the same thing here. So um, how it's gotten easier for me is first being able to look at life outside of prep. Um, it's also been easier being able to look at what I want to do or where I want to be in six months, one year or five years post show. Um, then anytime I'm having a hard time, I reflect on those goals and ask if my actions are aligned with what um, I want to happen. Because I can't sit around saying, oh, I want to achieve this. And then none of my actions reflecting that because then I'm never going to achieve it. And then I'm going to be living in the suck and in the crap because I'm not achieving it. Um, and then the other thing, um, it was in reference to what Alex said, as far as having a hard, hard time, um, just never being in a surplus or never, um, knowing what that feels like. And it's being able to give yourself grace and also know that when it comes to building muscle, you also got to add fat. You can't just add weight and then be pure muscle. And if you can do that, then please let me know your secrets. Um, but yeah, so it can be like crap every time if you don't address your crap. Um, but it definitely can be something that you learn from and apply and move forward. Okay. I've never heard the word crap used more in a singular segment in my entire life. But hey, <laughs> here we're we selling are. records. Yeah. Um, all right. 
recommendations for someone who doesn't want to give up distance running, but wants to build muscle? Uh, my recommendation to you is don't give up running. We've got to look at other factors here. It's not a uh, black and white scenario. Uh, we've got to find what you're recover recoverable from uh, is the main thing and how to balance the two. So your your training is going to need to be tailored to when you're running the, the frequent like the when you're running the frequency of, of your running the intensity the distance all of those factors need to be taken into account when creating your training um, so you can certainly distance run and add muscle tissue is it the most optimal situation no but it's what you enjoy and um, you've got to find a way to make it work is the the muscle gain going to potentially be slower is your um is your ability to run a greater distance potentially going to be shorter? Sure. Um, but what are we, what are we comparing it to? I, I think that if you put it in the context of like, yes, it's all going to be shorter than what's optimal or slower than what's optimal. Um, but the, the opposite of that is like, I stop running and I only focus on resistance training. Well, I, now I despise resistance training and all I want to do is run. And it's just like this back and forth kind of revolving door type situation. So, um, but finding yourself in a situation where you're you're eating more you are focusing a whole hell of a lot on your uh, sleep all those different facets are going to play a role in that you do not have to have only running or only weight training uh, or only gaining muscle um, the only time that i would say that that would be the case is if you're trying to be an elite runner or you're trying to get on the olympia stage i would in, i would tell you that hey Distance running probably is not going to be a goal of yours for quite some time if you're trying to get on the Olympia stage um, or you know, vice versa. Yeah, I, I, to exactly echo that. If you want to be elite at the thing you want to be elite at, you have to dedicate more to that, right? You have to more utilization towards that goal, right? More resource utilization towards that goal, uh, especially in that phase of life or chapter of life or chapter of that goal that you're currently in. Um, the next thing that I wanted to kind of mention there uh, to piggyback off Alex was what is your resilience physically through that stress, right? So for me to run a mile and for a long distance runner to run a mile, I'm going to look like Michael Scott running his uh, rabies marathon <laughs> versus, uh, you know, Toby who finish, finishes first, right? Did Toby finish mm -hmm. first? Yeah. I think so. Yeah. He gave yeah. him an uh, emodium instead of a laxative or something. <laughs> right. yeah. Yeah, so he yeah. didn't have to pee. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Right. Um, so basically, if, if we're looking at offense references, um, you know, I am definitely Michael Scott in this situation. Um, me running a mile is something of a torturous task and would absolutely have drastic effects on my ability to, to perform and train and recover. Um, but over time, I'll adapt and I'll get more resilient and I'll, I'll physically be able to, to handle that stress. But we're all genetically a bit different. We're all set up a bit different. We've all grown up to do different things. So if you come from a distance running background here, again, and if your goal isn't to be elite at either, but just really, you can be really good at both, but to be elite may be a different question. Um, and there's always anomalies. So if you're listening and you want to be elite at both, I'd say try it. And hell, you could be absolutely elite at both. I don't know. I mean, I know Alex has had a, someone who's ran a marathon and done a prep and, and seemingly did fine. So yeah. Yeah. <laughs> There's always so going to be those people and I'm not one of those people. Yeah, <laughs> I, wouldn't, I wouldn't advise what she did, although she did very, very well. And she <laughs> placed very, very well. I would not advise her to do that ever again. <laughs> right. And there's always outliers to that. And, yeah. and Bill, I'll just finish up here. The resilience to that though, body does adapt to movements. And again, the slower, you, if you're not someone who comes from those backgrounds, but you, you do want to improve in your long distance running, but also have a goal of gaining muscle or improving body composition. And in that goal comes building some muscle, then give yourself some time and build up that physical resilience, that recoverability, um, to, to actually facilitate those goals, um, long-term. Perfect. Well, we are getting close to the hour mark here. We're going to go through three more questions. So everyone's going to answer one more. Then we're going to wrap it up. If there's any of these topics that you really enjoyed and you want us to either deep dive in or make it a topic like some of our first few podcasts, then you can definitely let us know. We are always 
welcoming feedback to be able to improve and give the experience that you as the listener want. So next question here is how do I know when I should or shouldn't work out when sore? So this is a great question just because soreness is often looked at as an indicator of a good workout. So first note here is you don't want to be debilitated when it comes to soreness. Soreness is not an indicator of a good workout and it's not a badge of honor either. So let's say that you trained legs yesterday and today you still feel sore that's okay. You can go ahead and train upper body. But let's say you trained legs three or four days ago, and now it's time to train them again, and you're still sore, I would recommend moving your body that day and not specifically weight training. Now, another way to sidestep this is if you are having like extreme soreness with a muscle, Um, Well, I'll talk about different ways to help with recovery, um, but especially just moving your body. If you train and then don't move the rest of the day, that's where a lot of soreness can come from. So simply going on a walk, moving your body, doing some stretching, that can really, really help things. But you want to think in the back of your head, you want to hear my voice saying this, train hard recover harder. Because when you train, you are breaking down the muscle. And when you recover is when you are building the muscle. And if you train yourself into oblivion, you will not build the muscle that you want to. So um, like I said, you get those microscopic tears in your muscles, then you have to rest and recover to come back stronger. So some great ways to help with recovery if you're feeling that extreme soreness is one being able to lower the intensity or lower the frequency that you are weight training. Um, Being able to take more rest days is going to go hand in hand with that properly fueling your body. If you're under eating and then doing too much, that's where that excessive soreness is going to come from. But also making sure not only you're getting enough food, but that you're getting enough micronutrients, electrolytes, water, Um, prioritizing sleep and managing stress are going to be great ones as well. So like I said, moving is going to be great because you increase blood flow that can help you recover from soreness sooner. Um, But if you're having that every time you train like excessive soreness, and then like three or four days later, you're training the same muscle group and still having that excessive soreness, um, like consistently, then you need to reflect on what all you're doing instead of just being like, I'm sore because I'm working so hard and I'm building so much muscle and I grind all day. (laughs) Um, so uh, awesome. So, um, I I think as well, like if you're very, very new, um, so you're kind of getting into weight training or something like that, or you're getting back into weight training after a long stint off, uh, the repeated bout effect is going to take hold here, meaning that initially that stress is going to be a lot more of an overload than it otherwise be will be in, in subsequent sessions. Um, so the following sessions, so you'll be more sore the first couple of weeks than you will be the following couple of weeks. Depend, you know, if you're doing the same amount of volume and intensity and, and all of those things, if your workouts were to stay generally at, around the same. Um, and, and again, just to, to echo what, what Sue said there. I think she covered that extremely, extremely well. So, um, that really follows into our next question, which is, I know I need rest days, but they kill my mentality. Do you have any advice? Um, there's a lot of different pieces of advice that I could give, uh, from experience, finding a hobby, (laughs) probably a really good one. Um, and realizing that taking what Sue said, you're growing when you're recovering, right? You're while you're recovering, you're, you're going to be growing. And that's the process we're really trying to, to maximize. If we can train hard, we can break down the muscle. We can theoretically do, do our homework. That exam, that, that final grade comes from, from, from the recovery, right? So what we see at the end of the semester, quote unquote, I don't know why I'm in such a school mode these days, <laughs> but I think it's a really comparable thing that we've all been trudged through the mud our whole lives to understand is school and grades and, and that sort of thing. So, um, a relatable thing nonetheless. So find a hobby, uh, you know, find a hobby, find a hobby, find a hobby, find something to do. Um, be active on that day, find something, uh, that you enjoy to do that can be active. Um, if it's deathly cold where you are, then maybe, that's your time to, to snuggle up, cozy up, uh, maybe learn how to cook something, uh, play guitar, dig into that book, clean your house, do something inside. And if, you know, if you're like in the Northeast at this time, I'm very sorry. Uh, and your <laughs> life probably sucks, but if you're in Canada, Northern Canada, 
I wouldn't even think about going outside. But that said, if you're in a climate where you could go outside or you can bundle up and go outside, then still make that day active. Go for a hike, ride your bike, um, do something that is still going to be physically stimulating, mentally stimulating. Um, but you have to spend time away from the gym and, and psychologically, even, even like someone who comes from a background of really loving the gym, loving the environment of the gym, loving to get in the gym. It's not somewhere you need to spend seven days a week. Don't just go to the gym and show up and be like, well, it's my off day, but I'm here. Uh, I don't know what to do now, but I'm here. And it's like, I, I press to you to find a hobby, um, instead of doing that. But these other guys may have some better advice than I have. I wouldn't say it's better. I would say that um, the advice I have for someone who's in an, an intense kind of thought process here of, of feeling like a day away from the gym is is killing their mentality. I think that reframing what a rest day is for you is, is very important and looking at it as preparation for that next training session. Uh, I know for myself, if I have a really fun session coming up. Um, I, that this was me on Sunday. I knew that my Monday session was going to be uh, an absolute blast and I really wanted to hit it on Sunday, but I also understood that I needed the rest. So I was just visualizing. I had every you know set that I was going to have that next day already running through my brain and I was excited and things of that nature treated as kind of this visualization process and, and using those meals and the time that you are resting as a preparation work for that next session the next day or um, sessions to come. Uh, I think that reframing it that way is going to be beneficial for you to continue to see that progress. Um, and, you know, just chomping at the bit to get at the uh, get at the next session the, the following day. Yeah. And uh, if rest days um, for you are hard, first, really reflecting to understand why rest days are hard for you. If you feel like I'm going to lose progress, or you just like, I, I don't know whatever what other mindset you would have than like losing progress. Maybe you're a busy body and you have a hard time. If you don't have enough things to do at your own house, I have a lot at my house. So if it's boredom, then you can come over and hang out with me um, and I'll have plenty of things. But that's something I've always had to disconnect with just because I, I think that everyone has something that they can be doing, um, whether that is relaxing, which sometimes that is definitely the thing that I could be doing. Um, but I know that my laundry isn't always caught up on. My room isn't always clean. My clothes aren't always hung up. My office isn't always organized. There's always a book that I would love to read. There's always things to do. So it's very seldom that I am like, oh, I'm bored. I'm just going to go to the gym because I'm bored. Um, and maybe it's because I have trained for so not so long in the grand scheme of things, but I have trained for a good amount of time. And so I understand what it's like when I do train seven days a week and how awful I feel. And I don't want to feel that way. Um, but being able to look about what around the house or having those hobbies is going to be huge for you. Um, and being able to have something to do and not feel like you constantly need to be active um, to be able to see progress. Awesome. All right. Final question for this rapid fire q and I'm going to skip one because we have a lot of cycle related questions here that didn't get touched on. So in a future Q&A, we can certainly uh, touch on those things for you. But I'm going to touch on one here. Um, how can a female get her cycle back without a ton of body fat regain? Um, and, and what this person is referring to is the what's it called? Stephanie Buttermore made it popular. Uh, all in. The all in mentality of just eat absolutely everything until you're completely satiated to um, reset your hunger signaling as well as uh, regaining your cycle kind of as a subset of that. And um, the, the thought I have towards that is that it is going to take more time potentially to regain your cycle with a more uh, methodical approach within your um within your nutrition, uh, but also within the uh, regaining your cycle, there's a lot more components for us to look at outside of nutrients. We have, yes, nutrients are going to play a huge role, but we have to look at your physical activity. We need to look at your sleep. We need to look at your stress mitigation. Um, do you have, what are the relationships like in your life? Like all these different facets, we have a lot to look at outside of your nutrition. And if the individual is, is wanting to stay in a better body composition, which we are going to be an advocate for, uh, in the regain of that cycle, um, it definitely can happen without having this large surge of, of fat gain uh, throughout the process. Yeah. And I would say just being able to look at if you are trying to 
get your cycle back, you are trying to get healthy and being able to focus on that health instead of just strictly aesthetic. So you don't have to gain a bunch of weight, but it is something that you might have to gain some weight and being okay with it for the temporary to be in a healthier spot um, or to for the long term to be in a healthier spot to temporarily feel a little bit more uncomfortable. Um, so some things that you can do just for getting your cycle back in general that aren't going to necessarily have to do with gaining weight um, is going to be able to manage your stress, lower training intensity and frequency, make sure your sleep is locked down, don't be in a deficit. Um, and then there I mean, we could go hours and hours as far as cycle related stuff like Alex mentioned, but um, being able to realize that you want to focus on your health and not always your aesthetics and being able to think about the grander picture there. That's the rapid Q&A, folks. Thanks so much for listening and we'll see you next time.